Tonight, Panorama focuses on the terrace gangs who follow one small second division club, Millwall, in London's Dockland. Deliberately, we're looking at this violence through the eyes of some of the people who cause it, and that has involved, including in our film, language you don't usually hear on television. With that warning, here is David Taylor's report. When I was young and just a boy, I asked my mother, what will it be? Will it be Arsenal? Will it be Spurs? Is what she says to me. Supporting Millwall can be a costly business. Billy Plummer has accumulated £300 worth of fines for disorderly behaviour at football matches. He's 21, his brother Jason is eight, and already going to Millwall's home games. If Jason's not to follow in Billy's footsteps, it will take more than fines and fences to stop him. What will have to change is soccer's subculture, the basic set of values that the Terrace fan adheres to. Millwall is more than a football club, it's a way of life. It offers comradeship, excitement and glory. The glory comes not from the team, but from the reputation of its supporters. We're always in the sort of second and third life, but we're like people are frightened of us all over England. But supporters, best supporters in the lane. They go anywhere. Anyone comes down here, they, they get slung out, I'll tell you that now. All we're going for is right, a good game of football, a good punch up and a good piss up. And that's all about Millwall. The Lions of Millwall have earned their reputation the hard way, on the bleak, windswept terraces of the Football League. Come rain, come shine, a hard core of supporters turn up for away games. To the terrace gangland, they're the Millwall boot boys, feared and respected wherever they go, a fame infamously acquired. Like any other set of supporters, they cheer on their team, question the referee's parentage, exchange pleasantries with the police, whom they call the Old Bill, and go the opposition. But within Millwall's Terrace Army, there are divisions. At the bottom of the hierarchy are the youngsters. They call themselves the halfway line, and when it comes to aggro, they imitate their elders. But as they grow older, they have a career choice to make. Some of them graduated treatment, they're the ones in the surgical masks. Although one of Millwall's heavy mobs, treatment don't pick fights, but they're always there when they happen. In the trench warfare of the terraces, it's F Troop who go over the top. F Troop are the real nutters, self-confessed loonies like Harry the dog, who go looking for fights and are seldom disappointed. The difference between F Troop and Treatment was clearly illustrated when Millwall were away to Sunderland. Treatment, who will travel any distance for Millwall, made the long, expensive train journey to the northeast, while F Troop, who will go anywhere for a fight, stayed in London and went down the road to Charlton. Charlton were playing Millwall's traditional enemy, Tottenham. Five minutes into the game, this happened. The papers called it a terrace rampage. It was caused by a dozen or so of Millwall's nutters charging 2,000 Tottenham fans. Three of them ended up in court and one in hospital. You know, I mean, all the papers turned around and said there was about 100 of us. I mean, it was 12, 12, 14, wasn't it? Yeah. Say 14 the most. The most, that's it. Went in the ground, someone shouted out Millwall. Super Tottenham, jumped uh, over the fucking A couple of hundred of them <laughs> 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 the fucking pitch. Who's out of them? No. 
it's just that Sue Egg Tottenham now, they're in the second, do you know what I mean? No, they got a lot of rabbit, and they sit on the box down they, at the time. They keep saying what they're going to do to Millwall, so they get a taste of it before they come down here. Yeah. It's just to show what they're going to get come when they come down here, you know? That's all it's it is. It's all warm up, isn't it? Would you say the Charlton visit was a success? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right yeah. yeah. Very. 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 <laughs> best day, best day of the year, is it? Best day of the season. Yeah. So far, I know. So far. Yeah. Yeah. Days to come yeah. Not all of the drinkers in the Crown and Anchor agreed with F Troop's philosophy or with our right to film them. What do you want? What do you want? You want to say, oh yeah, we all had a punch up? That's not what football's about, is it? It is these days. Isn't that why? It is. It is. Why? You go away. You, you go away. Damn fuck. You go away. Oh, all right. Yeah. That's now. That's right. When's the last yeah. away game you went? You haven't got away, yeah? You went, well, when's the last away game you went? What, what are you talking about away? away. You go away, away every week. Not every week, no. no. no we do you, do you have to put up all the verbal we take every week? Yeah, but why should you have to take verbal? We don't, because I've been brought up like that. If someone has a go at me, I'll have a go at them. Yeah, oh, I agree with it. And I won't take it from a northerner. But you know? why? Because I won't. Because we won't. That's what I won't. Well, we Would you? Do. I've been following... I'll tell you what, I've been, I've been, I've been following this for years. I've been following this club years. Yeah, that's and I mean right. years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not going away for some dirty northern punts to spit all over me. No, if he no, spits no, over no, me, I'll put a fucking point glass in his head. There's no doubt that F Troop are Millwall's crazy gang. But the comfortable assumption that they're the only ones who fight on the terraces is far from being the truth. Fighting, or rucking as it's called, is bred in the bone. And in the pubs of South East London, it's a constant topic of conversation. Every Thursday night in the Squire in Bromley Road, treatment gather to relive their past exploits. Distant battles lodged in the memory like so many pieces of shrapnel. Old vendettas endlessly repeated. Sunderland, well... Sunderland, who went to Sunderland? 50, 50 stood at Sunderland, the tallest Millwall supporters. 120 travelled. 70 sat in the seats. About 40 of us still on the terraces. Come back alive. Right, yeah, you know what I mean. Anyway, we all come back alive, didn't we? Look at the Portsmouth, we went down Portsmouth. There's we 20 men in there, done nothing. They, they started throwing bricks, bottles at us. Yeah. You hit someone back and you get nicked 50 pound fine. But for hitting a geezer back, it just bottles you. It's always the same here. Tall stories measured out by the pint, amplified hard rock, the constant search for excitement and sensation for anything that will make these lads' lives seem less humdrum. In such a charged atmosphere, tempers are short and physical violence easily provoked. Oh, they're down there now. Even my bird's gone right, I was going to smash her in the chin. What can you say? It's not our fault, is it? No, no, it ain't your fault. Oh, yeah. well, I know, you made fat geezers. Treatment's world revolves around three fixed points football, pub and home, and they're never far apart. Drinking, working and living in New Cross, within a stone's throw of Millwall's ground, Billy Plummer is a typical member of the treatment gang. He left school at 13 and is well aware of his limited horizons. I love me, Mum, you know? Love me mum, of course. Anyone loves their mum, don't they? But uh, I've never had a dad in respect of a dad. My real dad le like left home, or well, he didn't. My mother kicked him out because he used to get come home and beat her up and all that. You know what I mean? Um, second, the second dad. He's inside at the moment. You know. He's all right, but he's not my real dad, is he? You know. I mean, me and him have never hit it off. I've never had a chance, really, you know, a chance to fulfill my ambitions, if I've got any ambitions, like, hidden. I don't know what they are. But a hard life as it happens. 
compared to some guys like you. I've had a very hard life. I've always been brought up to rowing, whereas you've been brought up in university, I've been brought up in street fighting, you know, every night. Do you know what I mean? I'd like to think that I could grow up, but I mean, I wouldn't be prepared to get, like, get married, have kids, and like, every week to worry about where the money's coming from, you know what I mean? That wouldn't be me, I'd never get married. I mean, I go and do what jobs here and there, and I get paid from that way. Like, I don't get, I don't have to wake up in the morning and think to myself, Christ, let's hurry, I've got to go to work. You know what I mean? You know? Just as long as I've got enough money to go and see me, all that does me. They're a shitty team, as it comes to respect of shitty teams. Yeah, they, they've never been in the first division. They never done nothing like that. But it's just, it's the fans, isn't it? Really, it's your mates down there, you mates you rely on. They go everywhere you go through the country with them. It's different clubs, and it's, you know. It's just there, terrific. They've never had nothing except their reputation, you know? Like, they've always got the reputation of being a hard team, and they always will be a hard team. Do you mean a hard team or hard supporters? Supporters, supporters hard supporters. You know, you've got a load of nutters out there, really. They're all supporters. They're all nutters. Have you had much trouble with the police yourself, Billy? Been in trouble a few times, yeah. Arrested? Yeah. And what happened to you when you went to court? Just get fined. You just get fined or you get put away. I won't pay me fines. I mean, I am a lot of money now, but I won't pay me fines. Do you think that fines are any kind of a deterrent to lads who get out of order at football matches? No, nah, they're not. How are they a deterrent? They're not a deterrent at all, are they, really? The deterrent is uh, making the geezers miss their football on Saturday. What do you think will happen to you the next time you get into trouble with the police? I don't really give a shit about it, really. I do time. I don't mind doing time. It's easy, isn't it? You come back out and you just support me a wall. You have more punch-ups and you just go back in. Don't you? And that's that. Why do you get in so many rucks, Billy? You get um, a lot of geese taking a piss at you at football. They turn round and they they just they start shouting things that you're chanting at you, you know what I mean? And you just, well, you just lose your temper. But why do you allow yourself to be provoked by the... Uh, uh, other team's fans. You don't have to fight, do you? Well, what are you going to be called, a coward? You don't want people to turn around and say, what's up with him, like, you know what I mean? He's not steaming in. Look at him over there, he's a coward, which does happen. Why don't uh, opposing fans come to Millwall's ground? Because they're scared. When they come down to Millwall, they get battered. They get battered. Same as Tottenham would get battered when they come down here, Tottenham, because they got too much mouth. Tottenham go around telling everyone they're going to do Millwall, let them, we'll let them come down and prove it. Next man's match with Tottenham is more than a London derby game. It's the only occasion on which a visiting club will bring mass support to the den. Because of Millwall's reputation, other side supporters tend to stay at home. Today, only a few courageous Blackburn Rovers fans have come to London. Some of them live to regret it. I arrived here about half past one quarter to two. We were walking down about 10 of us. We were about 20 lads run down. Are you Blackburn? Automatically, yeah, we're white men fans. Next thing I knew, I would up to Buddy Hell out of. They hammered the hell out of me. I saw my score off at four. I picked it up. There were three at the other end. So they started hitting me again. So I, I walked away automatically. So I'll never go come here again. There's no way I'll be here again. I've been to United, Everton, City, Liverpool, everywhere around. But not, not walking down the ground at half past one and being jumped on like that. That is pathetic, is that? The crowd for the Blackburn match was less than 6,000, and the club lost much needed gate money. Whatever happens when Tottenham come down, low attendance won't be a worry. This is the Colbro Lane End, Millwall's home terrace. On past experience, it's where Tottenham's fans will make their first assault. Although today, with little at stake, it's sparsely populated, it will be well guarded for the Tottenham game. Gangs like Treatment will be there in strength to defend their traditional territory. Many parents brought their kids down. Even my brother took me down to Millwall and the entrance we went in and where we stood is where we stood. And that is under the Coldblow Lane end. If Tottenham are ejected from the Coldblow Lane end, they may well be moved to what passes for a visitor's terrace at Millwall, the Ilderton Road end. Here, however, they'll encounter Millwall's nutcases like F-Truth. 
will be standing there for that precise purpose. If I want to go all support, I would go down there. The fucking man. Straight, everyone carries a tool. If you're a visiting supporter, there's no safe standing room in the lion's den. Even the side terrace, which in most grounds is a neutralized zone, is guarded by the halfway line, the novices who make up in numbers for what they lack in strength. Where do you stand on the terraces? Halfway line. Halfway line. The biggest end. That's the best thing. That top will come line. in. I reckon they're going to take their end. They come up to us, but then we'll just gather up and go into them. Gary Roberts is 16, a former halfway liner. He's just graduated to treatment. Although still at school, Gary prefers to spend his time with his best friend, Mick Harris. At 27, Mick is one of treatment's oldest members. He works as a caretaker for an experimental playgroup and is surprisingly good with children. What's that? That's a water ring. Where does the water ring can go? Which one's got the water ring can? You've got the water ring can there, haven't you? When we came back from Coventry, we had a rap at um, St Pancras with Bolton Wonders, like. And we, as I stood there and rapped with him, he said, well, any man who can stand there and rap can go to um, Southampton with us next week. Ever since I've been going around with him, and he's a great bloke. I know he's probably going to school, but it's just his way. If you've got a bit of a wild temper and no-one's supporting you, you're just going to fling out, fist and feet, like, and just walk out, which he's been doing. And then he just comes down here for company, like, you know, he just comes down here because he knows me. Mick and Gary are also bound together by their allegiance to treatment and can recite the gang's code of conduct. When police are knocking about, you don't sort of steam in and do something silly where they can have you. You use the loaf and when it's clear and they, you know there's going to be trouble, you've got to be there. And as I say, to be a, a sort of a treatment member, You've just got to sort of stay there and stay your own pitch. If there's going to be a rut, you stay there. And then that's only a certain few that travel away. As 50 of us went to Sunderland a couple of weeks back, and uh, that is what you call a treatment mob. Gary, you're in treatment now, aren't you? Yes. Did you have to prove yourself before you were able to join the gang? Well, I stood, stood down. Rocky Hood Mill will stay there and if we was that number like 20 at one, we had to stay there and fight like, you know what I mean, and all that like. Huh? So you proved that you were a good rocker? Well, I wouldn't say I'm a good rocker, but I wouldn't, wouldn't know. I'd stay there and fight and help him out. Is he good, Mick? Uh, yeah, any blokes, any blokes that don't run and you're away from home and stand there and have a good fight is a good Mill supporter. But is that and, really what football's about? We know it's not about fighting, but the thing is, when as you as you go up to see a football match, a few just happen to be there. It's the other adults, as you're saying about me, that I'm an adult and I've got a job with kids, everything like that. It's adults fighting me as well, and I am just going to stand there and let them do it. So I'm... soccer hooligans are not 14, 15 year olds. No. no. I, I travelled up to Blackburn last year when so-called hooligans, 30 years old, and I still remember some of them faces that give me a hammer in at Blackburn some six, seven years ago. And they're blokes. They're not just 14, 15-year-old kids. It's blokes as well. So anyone who goes on the terraces has got to be prepared for trouble? Of course they are. Uh, it all depends where they stand on the terrace. And if they like to stand on the terrace, but somewhere else, but no matter where you stand, you're going to get trouble because as soon as you shout out, for instance, if you're way at Sunderland and a Mill will score a goal, you shout out, Mill wall like and one up, you get people having a go at you, being rubbish and all that game. And that's what you get. And people just don't stand for that. Mick, when are you going to outgrow football and Mill wall? When are you going to settle down and get married? Settle down and get married? Well, Getting married, you're restricted, and you can't travel away with a team you love and love like, you know? And I was going to get married, but I knocked it on the head, all over Millwall. Were you going to get married to Lorraine? Yes, that's correct. And uh, we was arguing... I've done myself a favour. We was arguing over football. She liked Chelsea, and I'm a fanatic Millwall supporter. 
but I just couldn't go through with it. And I ended up sodding off up north to watch Millwall and left there waiting. On your wedding day? On the verse of a wedding day, yeah, because we were going to get the licence out, get there and do it. She was preparing it and I didn't turn up. You went to watch Millwall instead? I went to watch Millwall. No greater love have any man. This is it. This fanaticism has deep social roots. Millwall is in the heart of London's dockland, and though many of the docks have closed and the dockers moved away, old allegiances die hard. To the dockers, football was a religion and Millwall the only true faith. What's wrong with Millwall is the image the club has got. To approach it is to feel a sense of grim foreboding. The very names are chilling. The address, Cold Blow Lane. The ground itself, the den, more of a threat than an invitation. I've only got two more, there will be no more. Millwall is trying to put matters right. Every Sunday morning they run a street market. It makes money for the club and stresses Millwall's community spirit. The club also hold open days at which Millwall's fans can meet the players. This is one of manager Gordon Jago's many innovations. I'm trying to bring about a good relationship between the fan and the player. I think that the secret of success in any sport is an involvement with its people, whether they be people on the terraces or whether they be people who pay anything from £100 upwards for a season ticket. See, a football club mustn't cut itself off from its supporters. You've got to have, as we have done today, we have had uh, broad shoulders because we're going to get some criticism. Uh, but you've got to get involved. You've got to go and face them, meet with them, tell them what you're trying to do, listen to their arguments, listen to their criticisms. Um, because you are very much a part of their life. And I think you have a responsibility. The interesting thing to me is, you see, people um, say, well, go out and buy a centre forward. I've got to make sure it's the right one. A, I've got to make sure, and B, I've got to get the money. Yeah. That's right. Right? This is the problem. Now, the only way we can take more money is get more people here. And I tell you, one of the problems that we don't get people here, for example, when we played Crystal Palace and Charlton, mm. we didn't get a Crystal Palace or Charlton support. No. 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 They didn't. No, no, no. And they don't yeah. come here. Why? We haven't had Hold on. No. Seven years. Hold on, hold on. You're right. They don't come here because they say fear the trouble. fear of trouble. trouble yeah. Millwall's got a reputation. Yeah. Now, this yeah. is where you fellas can help all of us, you know. Uh, that that. Mills all, that. All, all been all been all all when they're with Jago, the Millwall lads are very respectful. No Butter wouldn't the melt in their mouths. You would know, but Brighton broke, the Brighton right. broke out of the terrace, there was no fight. But back in their own familiar haunts, the mood quickly changes. Once again, they're the tough guys, the pool room hustlers calling the shots as they see them. And Gordon Jago appears as just another figure of authority who doesn't understand them. He's never been on the terrace, the same as our day, you know, rest of them. They sit in their silly little offices saying this, that and the others, what we're not supposed to do. They don't go out and see, see the grounds, do they? Hey. Well, you were talking to him on well, Sunday, Billy, and you didn't say that then to him. No, because I got the hunt then. I've just lost the pool and everything else. And the fucking team's lost 2-0. How unusual, I must say. Fucking joke. Very unusual, yeah. <laughs> No, we can't. See, that's what makes me sick. It's these guys like Alan Ardaker and all these, right? They sit in their offices saying, you can't do this and you can't do that. But where are they when we on a Saturday afternoon? No matter what I say when I meet them, and we've had get-togethers with them at supporters' club meetings uh, and so on, and you say, look, cut it out. We don't want that. You know, you're spoiling it for all of us. And um, unfortunately, you know, one cannot seem to change them. They, they, this is their attitude and... Uh, you know, we have to uh, find ways and means of uh, stopping it all. What's the thing you can do? Just turn around and say Merlin and say, all right, you just ain't going to come down here. Yeah? It's so, one club he never... Well, you, can, you never change me a Same as you never change West Ham or you never change Chelsea. You'll always have fun. Every, every football club in the country's got hooligans. People are getting to the stage now where they're absolutely fed up with it. And they say, OK, because the answer to me is, is one thing only. If I could have a 25,000 or 20,000 all-seat stadium here and all sold, as a season ticket sale to Millwall supporters, that would suit me fine. I wouldn't wish to... Uh, I know it deprives, shall we say, the opportunity for visitors to see their team in action here, but if it's one way to stop confrontation, then that's what I would do. If Jago succeeds in banishing Millwall's terrace hooligans, there's one organisation that would welcome them with open arms. Front news. Front news. 
The National Front is having a lot of success in recruiting football fans, not only from Millwall, but from many inner-city clubs. As always, the Front's basic appeal is racist. I don't think anyone is sort of like really 100%. I don't care what anyone says, you know. I don't think anyone is actually 100% for the NF. But and then again, you've got to think like, I mean, we're all here, like, sort of, everyone here sort of works and all this paper. And then, like, you have the sun on the da Daily Mirror saying, you have a reading now. And then they're like, you, you see, there's an Asian family just come up a banana boat in an hotel for about £300 a week. Who's the mugs? It's got to be us, isn't it? Racism apart, what the Millwall lads really like about the National Front is the opportunity it provides for a good ruck. At the Lewisham march, at least a hundred of them turned out to heckle and harass the anti-front demonstrators. I'll go on them, yeah. Because, like, uh, all these... Yeah. yeah. Because all these go, and me, me mates go on it. When I go there, you know, I'll go with all these, like... It's all right, it's a lot of it, you know? What do you go for? Huh? What do you go for? Is it for the fight? What do you mean? Of course it's for the fight. What do you think every National Front march they have is for a fight? It's a publicity, isn't it? We will recruit patriotic, pro-British youngsters, whether or not they are physically robust, because we need everybody in the National Front. We are, in addition to that, very glad to recruit youngsters who are of a robust dis disposition and who are willing and able to defend our legal activities from communist assault where necessary. Disturbingly, the leadership of the National Front seem more prepared to understand the soccer hooligan psychology than our football's official bodies. I think there's a lot you can do uh, with a soccer hooligan. I think that people resort to mindless violence and vandalism because they have not been given by, so by society a point and a meaning to their lives. People do like to identify, they do like to associate themselves with something which is big and glorious and noble, which they, the little individual, can associate themselves with and feel proud that they somehow belong. Uh, and we feel that um, the very, very fanatical adulation by supporters with their particular club is a sort of sublimated patriotism. So it's a case of Millwall today and National Front tomorrow? We hope so. Today it's still Millwall. There are times when Gordon Jago's vision of a football club being a happy family almost seems possible. For all its apparent hardness, Millwall is a friendly, hospitable club in its own working-class Cockney way. To strengthen its links with the fans, Millwall runs its own supporters club. Those who join are entitled to cheap travel to away games. Applicants are fitted out with ID cards, which they have to carry with them. And anyone who gets into serious trouble with the police is liable to have his membership revoked. For Millwall's away game with Bristol Rovers, Supporters Club Secretary Pauline McGrath has chartered a train from British Rail. To keep order during the journey, Pauline has recruited a number of stewards, some of whom, like Mick Harris, belong to the treatment gang. So Barry and Ray, um, Mickey. Saturday morning at Paddington and Millwall supporters are in good heart. In spite of the team's failure to win any of their last seven matches, 214 supporters make the journey to Bristol. Where football is concerned, hope springs eternal. Charter trains are one way of curbing the soccer hooligans. Since they first came into operation two years ago, the cost of the damage to British Rail property has been reduced from £100,000 to next to nothing. Not that Millwall supporters were ever keen on vandalism. We've got standards. I mean, you're not like your Uniteds and your Chelsea's that go around kicking and cripples in wheelchairs and things like that. If there's a bystander there, like a woman with a baby, they'd help that woman and the child out of the way and then carry on with a racket. <laughs> There are railway police on the train, but they keep out of sight and leave it to the stewards. The atmosphere is free and easy. The lads while away the time in gambling, drinking and talking about football. We always do try to charter trains when we travel away. It's much easier. 
to get all the supporters together on one train. If you don't charter a train, they'll travel anyway. And they'll travel on several service runs. And obviously, it isn't good for the club, it isn't good for our reputation. We find if we've got them all on one train, we know who they are, and we can control them. Unfortunately, not all of Millwall's supporters travelled on the train. Half of them made their own way to Bristol, including F Troop, who hired a coach for the occasion. Bobby the Wolf, Harry the Dog, Mad Pat and Winkle piled into the bus, which at three pounds a head was a pound cheaper than the train. Troop were not just going for the match, but for a night out on the town. They didn't intend to leave Bristol until two o'clock in the morning. This contravenes the official guidelines laid down by the Minister of Sport, Dennis Howell. Coaches are required to leave town within an hour of the final whistle, and they're not supposed to carry any alcohol. It is perhaps hardly surprising that the coach operator should be unaware of these rules when clubs like Millwall are also in the dark about them. Well, in actual fact, I've never seen any guidelines. I don't know anything about them. We, we don't... You know, you've, you've caught me there because I don't know anything about any guidelines. We just run our away travel on our own common sense and experience. When the Millwall train reached Bristol, the fans were escorted to the ground by the local police force. The police had a hundred men on duty for the game, a tribute, if you like, to Millwall's reputation. To avoid this reception committee, F Troop intended to be dropped off in town so they could invade the Bristol Rovers' end. Well, we want to do a few gazes out there, like. Some pretty F Troop, see what I mean? We love a row. We got football. And this is it. Oh, look, too bad, Harry, look. Is that more important than the football? No, that's well, it's about equal. To me, we're not past the limit. We're going there, you look, we've got no boots on, nothing. You know? We go there, no scarves, we never wear our colours, nothing. We go there, if we're going to Bristol Wind, we'll go there for a drink. They know we're Londoners, they can tell you're Londoners, you know? 15 times smaller. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Give us credit. Uh, we go there, like, and you've always got that one northerner who wants to have a go at you. So, like, if they have a go at you, like, you're going to have a go back. It's not being an hooligan. Unfortunately for F Troop, their coach broke down. But there were other coaches and other nutcases. And the scheduled ruck took place. Without F Troop, the Millwall invaders got short shrift from the home fans. And then the old Bill waded in. Penned at the opposite end, Treatment and the rest of Millwall's supporters club could only offer vocal encouragement. This is what is known as Millwall Agro. The tide of battle turned against Millwall's hooligans. It was all over in five minutes. Four arrests were made and numerous troublemakers weeded out, including Harry the dog, who, having hitchhiked to the ground, had staged an unsuccessful solo attack on the Bristol end before being escorted to the Millwall Terrace. It was a bad day for the visitors. The weather was bad, the game was bad, and the unkindest cut of all, Millwall lost to a team Tottenham had massacred 9-0 a fortnight earlier. Treatment professed themselves to be pissed off and as sick as a parrot. But they'll all be back next week. At Millwall, as at most football clubs, violence is only one side of the coin. On the other side are good humour, companionship and a sense of belonging, which for these lads would be hard to replace. 
Of course, measures must be taken to curb the excesses of soccer violence. But if those measures drive the terrace fans out of football, the cure may prove worse than the disease. That was David Taylor reporting. We want to thank Millwall Club for their help. Alone, among several clubs we approached, they were willing to cooperate with us. Millwall, in fact, is going some way to meeting the problem of violence constructively. They're hoping to build a sports centre with the idea of diverting the youngsters' energies from fighting to active sport. And that may be closer to a real solution to the problem of football violence than putting up fences. That's one of the things we were going to discuss tonight, if it hadn't been for the farmers' strike. That's all from Panorama this week. Till next Monday. Good night.